thank you very much. Um, so you guys are going to get a double dose of me this afternoon. And what I'm going to be talking about is more than 50 years of research at the University of Virginia involving cases of children from various parts of the world who have reported a memory of a previous life. Uh, and I will start with an example. So we got a letter one day from a mother in Oklahoma in the southwest U.S. who said that she and her husband were just ordinary people. Uh, she worked in the county clerk's office and her husband was a police officer. But for the last year, her five-year-old boy, Ryan, had talked about a past life in Hollywood. And he would cry and beg his mother to take him home to Hollywood, often on a daily basis. So to try to help him deal with this material, she decided to go to the public library and check out some books on Hollywood to see if this would help him process all this. And um, they were looking through one one day when they came to this picture from an old movie called Night After Night. And Ryan pointed to the second man in the picture and said, hey, Mama, that's George. We did a picture together. And then he pointed to the one on the far right and said, and Mama, that's me. I found me. Well, the first man he pointed to was George Raft, who was a well-known actor back in his day. Um, but the second one that he pointed to, the one that he said he had been, was an extra with no lines in the movie. So Ryan's mom wrote to me to see if I could help determine who this fellow was. So I flew out to Oklahoma, I met Ryan and his parents, and then after I came back, as we were trying to figure out who this fellow was, um, Ryan's mom was emailing me, sometimes on a daily basis, with all of these statements that Ryan was making about his past life. And, and was describing quite a life that, frankly, I thought was unlikely for an extra with no lines in a movie. Um, eventually, with the help of a uh, Hollywood archivist, we were able to figure out who this man was. The archivist, she went to the library of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and got all the materials out on this movie night after night, most of which involved the stars of the movie. But then she found this picture, and on the back of it was a caption. And it said, what the well-dressed racketeer will wear. Marty Martin playing a racketeer in Paramount's Night After Night with George Raft and the other stars gives a demonstration of underworld sartorial excellence. So then I watched the movie again to uh, make sure that it that in fact this was who Ryan had pointed to uh, and then later we got confirmation from Marty Martin's family that in fact Marty Martin was who Ryan said he had been. Um, and Marty Martin uh, died in 1964 and even though I thought it was unlikely that he had had the kind of life that Ryan described it turned out that Marty Martin did. So Ryan said that he had danced on Broadway uh, and Marty Martin danced on Broadway. Um, he said that he then went to Hollywood and worked in the movies, which Marty Martin did working mostly on dance in the movies. Uh, he said that he worked at an agency where people changed their names, and Marty Martin started a successful talent agency. Um, he also said that he had seen the world from big boats and talked about going to Paris, and Marty Martin and his wife went to Europe on the Queen Mary and uh, visited Paris. Ryan said that he had a uh, big house with a swimming pool, which Marty Martin did. And Ryan said that the street address had the word rock or mount in it. And Marty Martin lived on North Roxbury. Um, Ryan also said one time that he didn't know why God would let you get to 61 and then make you come back again as a baby. Um, and when we got Marty Martin's death certificate, 
it showed that he was 59, so it looked like that was one that Ryan was off on. But then Marty Martin's daughter and his stepson both said, no, in fact, he was 61. So I looked into it and found a passenger list, three census records, and two marriage listings that all gave ages that meant Marty Martin was, in fact, 61 when he died. So even though the death certificate said 59, Ryan was correct when he said 61. Now, I mentioned that uh, Marty Martin had a daughter, and she was only eight when he died. Um, but I met with her, and there was a lot about his life that she didn't know since she had been so young. In fact, she didn't even know about one of his sisters that he had. But between talking with her and reviewing the records that we were able to find, we eventually verified that over 50 of Ryan's statements matched Marty Martin's life. And then we decided to have a meeting uh, where Ryan would meet Marty Martin's daughter. Now, he was concerned about that meeting ahead of time. He, we explained that she was an older adult um, and he said he didn't believe that she was as old as we were telling her, but telling him because he didn't think he'd been gone that long. And then when we had the meet, it was a very awkward meeting. Uh, Ryan really seemed overwhelmed by, by the whole thing. Uh, but then afterwards, he enjoyed visiting the building where Marty Martin's talent agency uh, had been. And <clears throat> after that trip, he started wearing what he called his agent glasses. Uh, if you notice, Marty Martin, the pictures of him later in life, he had glasses with um, big, uh, thick black rims on them. Well, Ryan got some um, frames, 3D glasses from a movie theater, and, and he popped out the, uh, the lenses, so he would wear what he called his agent glasses. And his shirt says, they'll make a movie about me someday. And not sure that that's true, but his case was eventually featured uh, on the NBC Nightly News. Uh, so that was all nine years ago, and he's now 15. I, I actually had the opportunity to meet with him recently, and he's doing very well. He's got a lot of friends at school. He, he does quite well academically, and he does not talk anymore about his past life. So to tell you how this work uh, began. It, it began with a man named Ian Stevenson. Um, who here has heard of Ian Stevenson before? So, well, most people. Uh, so he, he was a remarkable person and, and he came to the University of Virginia in 1957 to be the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry. And he was in the middle of a perfectly successful mainstream career at that point. Uh, he was still in his late 30s when he came to be chairman. But um, he had kind of an interesting backstory. His mother was a theosophist. So he was exposed to theosophist literature in her library when he was growing up. Um, and he also had an interest in parapsychology. In fact, when he interviewed for the position, he told them that he had an interest in parapsychology. But he had a lot of other interests as well, and, and nobody seemed to mind. Uh, but then once he came to the university, he learned about this phenomenon of young children in different places who said they remembered a past life. And Ian decided to go investigate. So he heard about five cases in India, and he, small, he got a small grant to visit India uh, to investigate those cases. He went there for a month and found 25 cases. And he got similar results in Sri Lanka, and he realized that this phenomenon was much more common than anyone in the West, at least, had known about before. So he got intrigued. And once he published his first paper on these cases, uh, one of the people who read his paper was a man named Chester Carlson. Um, Carlson had invented the Xerox machine, and this must be a very early version of a Xerox machine. Um, but he was quite wealthy, and he began funding Ian's work. So Ian studied these cases more and more. Uh, eventually, 
Carlson gave enough funding where Ian was able to step down as chairman of the department in 1967 and started a small research division uh, which is now known as the Division of Perceptual Studies or DOPS for short. And then with Ian, he spent the bulk of the next 35 years focused on these cases. Um, he took trips all over. This is him in Burma. Um, picture doesn't project all that well, but if you can imagine an American professor shows up in an Asian village and starts asking about past life memories, I would draw quite a crowd. Uh, so he would often have to designate one chair as the witness seat and just have one person talk at a time and, and tell him about what had gone on. Um, so he took trips all over, mostly in Asia, but to other places as well. And he always used a very careful methodical approach when he investigated these cases. He never assumed that they were due to reincarnation. Instead, what he was trying to determine was exactly what the child had said about a past life, whether those statements could be found to match somebody who had actually lived and died, and whether the child could have accessed that information through some sort of normal means. And this is the approach that we still use today. So as I talk about these cases, I may not say alleged memories or apparent memories, but we certainly consider it an open question as we approach each case. Um, Ian wrote numerous books and scores of papers about these, these cases. Uh, one of his books was reviewed in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, actually reviewed by the book review editor who wrote, uh, in regard to reincarnation, he has painstakingly and unemotionally collected the detailed series of cases from India, cases in which the evidence is difficult to explain on any other grounds. He has placed on record a large amount of data that cannot be ignored. Now, the latter part of that turned out not really to be true in the sense that many people did ignore the data. Um, but that did not dissuade Ian. He uh, kept working, and he worked for years on another book that I'll tell you about in the second half of my uh, talks. Uh, and he also worked to get other researchers involved. One of the criticisms of Ian's work was that he was the only one finding these cases. Uh, but eventually he got several psychologists uh, and an anthropologist um, involved in studying them first with him and then independently. And then I got involved as a child psychiatrist uh, in the late 1990s. Meanwhile, Ian continued to work. Um, he officially retired in 2002, uh, but uh, he was well into his 80s at that point, but still took one more trip to India. Uh, his wife said one time that she didn't mind him taking his trips, she just wished that he would stop saying that each one was going to be his final trip. Um, <clears throat> and then he passed away in 2007, uh, remaining active almost until the very end. Uh, a year before he died, he published his last paper, which was a wonderful review called Half a Career with the Paranormal. And he finished the paper with these words, so his final published words were, let no one think that I know the answer, I am still seeking, uh, which I thought was a nice way to go out. He, he certainly never claimed to have all the answers. Um, as for DOPS, with the, the help of other donors, we're still going. Um, this is most of us, uh, the current crew, and we are in the Ian Stevenson Memorial Library. Uh, where there are several thousand very interesting books. Um, and we do work in a variety of areas. The, the person sitting on the right is Bruce Grayson, who is the world's leading academic researcher on near-death experiences. Uh, we also, with, with the help of a different donor, we have a, a neuroimaging lab now. Uh, so we're, we've just started a study um, in the lab with mediums and they're hooked up to EEGs and other things measuring what's going on in their brains while they're uh, trying to contact the dead. 
Um, and we're also, of course, continuing to work with children's past life memories, which is my particular area of interest. Um, so to tell you more about the phenomenon, so these cases typically involve very young children who spontaneously start talking about a past life. This work does not involve hypnotic regression, but rather the kids just start coming out with these things, uh, typically describing a recent ordinary life. Uh, they are not talking about being kings or queens. They almost never talk about fa being famous people, but rather somebody typically who lived fairly close by who uh, just had an ordinary life. And when I say recent, the average interval between the uh, death of the previous person and the birth of the child is four and a half years. Now, there are certainly exceptions, like Ryan's case, it was 40 years, but for the most part, it is quite recent ones. Some of the kids talk about being a deceased family member, like a, a grandparent, uh, but others, like Ryan, describe being a stranger in another location. And if the kids give enough details, like the name of that location, then people have often gone there and found that, in fact, somebody did live and die who matches the statements that the, life, that the child gave. In that case, we say it's a solved case. If a child talks about past life memories, but no one's able to verify that the statements match an actual person who died, we say it's an unsolved case. Uh, we have plenty of both kinds in our collection, uh, but two-thirds of the ones that, that we've studied are, in fact, solved. And, and of course, those tend to be uh, the most interesting cases. The one part about the past life that is often out of the ordinary is how the previous person died. Over 70% of the time, the previous person died by unnatural means, meaning murder, suicide, combat, accident, that sort of thing. So that certainly seems to be an, import, an important factor in this phenomenon. So we've looked at this a little bit. Um, with each case, we code them on 200 variables and then put the information into a database. And it is taking us years and years to get all the old cases coded, but we've now got over 2,000 of them in the database. So we can look at various features of the cases, and one thing that we've looked at is the mode of death. Um, so I'll warn you, this, this slide I'm about to show you looks rather complicated, but it's not as bad as it looks. So with this graph, going up and down is the number of cases, and going across is the age when the previous person died. The green bars on top are the natural death cases, and then the other colors are the various kinds of unnatural death cases. So the main point of this slide is to show you that we have a lot of unnatural death cases, but it also looks like the previous person uh, was often dying young. The complicating factor is that people who die unnatural deaths tend to die younger because it's younger people who tend to do things like drive too fast or get in knife fights or whatever it is. Um, but what we can do with the database is we can pull out the unnatural death ones, look just at the natural death to see if dying young is a factor that's separate from dying violently. Now this next graph is just one that I pulled off the internet. It's a typical graph of deaths by age. Again, deaths going up and down, the age when someone died going across. And this is what you typically see, this gradually upsloping curve as you move across the lifespan as more and more people are dying. And then at the end, there's so few people left that you know, in the 90s and above, it, it really drops off. But for but the most part, it's gradually upsloping curve. Well, our cases, Looking at just the natural death ones, we see that the curve actually goes in the other direction. And in fact, a quarter of the cases, the previous person was age 15 or less. So there seems to be something about dying violently or dying young that makes it more likely that a child will later remember that life. Now, as far as the cases go, uh, we have now studied over 2,500 of them uh, from around the world. I, I've listed, one well, of the tabs got off, but I, I've listed the places where we have the most cases. And they are in 
cultures with the belief in reincarnation. Um, and these countries, we have the most cases there because that's where we've had people looking for them. Uh, but in fact, cases have been found wherever anyone has looked. Uh, they've been found on all the continents except Antarctica, uh, where no one has looked. Um, and they are found in the West as well. Now, they seem to be harder to find here. Well, they are harder to find here. And it may be that they're less common. But in a lot of these countries, if a child starts talking about a past life, then uh, the parents will tell people word would spread, and eventually one of our associates would learn about the case and report it to us. Whereas in the West, families are often embarrassed by what their children are saying, and they don't tend to tell people. In fact, we've had plenty of cases where the grandparents didn't even know about it because the parents were trying to keep the children quiet. Nonetheless, we have gotten cases from the West. Um, in fact, Ian published a book, European Cases of the Reincarnation Type, uh, with a number of cases. Often, unfortunately, the cases were coming to him late. Uh, people would learn about his work and write to him, but by then the, the child was no longer a child. It might be a 30-year-old. Um, but we are now hearing from more and more American parents. With, with the advent of the Internet, we don't have to find American cases because they find us. So we are typically hearing from about 10 to 15 American families each month uh, reporting that their child is describing a past life. And um, I now focus on these American cases um, because I, I think I chose to focus on them for a couple of reasons. One, I felt like if a couple of thousand cases from Asia had not convinced people to take a look at this phenomenon, there was no number that would. Uh, and I felt that the American cases might get people's attention more, that if people know that the kid down the street might be talking about a past life, they'd be more likely to take this seriously. And, and I think certainly some of the cases have gotten quite a bit of notice. And with the American cases, most of them come from families who had no belief in reincarnation before the child started talking about a past life. Um, and what we see with the American cases is that they have the same features as the cases from other countries. So we don't use the word proof very often in our line of work, but the American cases are proof that children describing past lives, that it is not purely a cultural phenomenon. Because these cases are taking place in a culture without a general belief in reincarnation and taking place in families without a belief in reincarnation. Now that raises the question, at least with the American cases, could these apparent memories be due to some sort of psychological disturbance in the child? Uh, so we've done psychological testing with a number of them, and we found that they are not dissociating, they are not showing any psychological disturbance. The one thing that came out of the testing was the children tend to be very intelligent and very verbal, uh, but otherwise they seem to be perfectly ordinary kids. Now, <clears throat> as far as the kids go, I mentioned that as young children, it tends to be very young children. So the average age when a child starts talking about a past life is 35 months. So it's usually a two or a three year old who starts coming out with these statements. And some do it in sort of a detached way, but many of them show strong emotional involvement with this material like Ryan did. So uh, they may, um, um, cry and, and beg to be taken back to their previous home or to their previous family. Um, some of the kids will show anger, especially if the previous person uh, was, was murdered. Uh, there was one case I studied in Thailand where the previous person had been killed in a hunting accident. Uh, it was a young man who was accidentally shot and killed by a friend of his. And then a few years later, a boy was born in the same village who had memories of his life. And when he was two, he tried to choke the man who had accidentally killed the previous person. Um, and what we see is that in the stronger ki cases, the kids tend to show more emotion as they talk about these things. But even so, they can show 
um, great emotion, great intensity one minute, and then just run off and play the next. Some of the kids have access to this material at all times, but for others, they have to be in the right frame of mind to access it. And it's usually during a relaxed time, like um, after a bath or during a long car ride or something like that, then the kids will start coming out with this material. Uh, we had one case actually in Charlottesville where a woman was driving down the road with her son in the back seat and all of a sudden her son pops up and says, in my last life I drove a big truck. And that was the only thing he ever said about it. But that, that one time he seemed to get a glimpse of, of that memory. Uh, and then by the time the kids are six or seven, most of them stop talking about the past life and, and then just go on with their lives. And it seems that many of them, and probably most of them, lose the memories. Uh, but we're currently doing a study where we are interviewing adults who we originally studied when they were kids. And quite a few of them say they still have at least some memories uh, of the past life. Uh, even though they did stop talking about them, they got fully wrapped in this, up in this life. But for a number of them, they, they didn't completely lose the, the memories. Um, now, as far as when they talk about the past life, what they talk about, um, they don't tend to come out with enlightened words of wisdom. I mean, these, these are not like little mystics. Uh, instead, what they typically do is focus on things from the end of the previous life. So, uh, three quarters of them will describe the death of the previous person. And again, often it's, it's quite a violent death that, that is really traumatic for the child to recall. Um, and they will also talk about people or events from near the end of the life. So, if a child is remembering the life of someone who died as an adult, then, then they'd be more likely to talk about a spouse or kids than to talk about the, the previous parents. Um, so it seems as if the memories have just sort of picked up where they left off at the end of the last life. Now in addition, uh, about 20% of the kids will talk about events between lives, things that they say happened after they died in the last life but before they were born in this one. Um, some of them will describe the previous funeral. Uh, there was one case of a little girl in Thailand who reported a lot of memories, but one thing was that she complained that her ashes had been um, scattered rather than buried the way she wanted them to be. Well, it turned out the previous woman uh, had wanted her ashes buried under the bow tree of the temple complex where she studied, but when her daughter went to bury them, the root system of the tree was so extensive that she couldn't, so she scattered them instead. Um, I also saw a case, a uh, little boy in Thailand one time who uh, was a twin, and he said that he and his brother had been friends in the past life, and they had been uh, trying to steal livestock when they had been shot and killed. He said that he then got on a bus and they were riding around and he saw his future mother picking flowers beside the road and thought she looked nice and decided to follow her home to be born into her family. Now I hope when I die that I won't have to take a bus to get to where I'm going. Um, but that's what he said anyway. Other kids will talk about going to heaven, and the American kids may use the word heaven, uh, but they'll talk about going to other realms like heaven anyway. And then some of them will talk about either being guided to their next family or choosing their next parents from heaven and then um, um, joining the family uh, and starting a new life. Now, in addition, um, Sometimes the statements include instances where the child recognizes or identifies people or places from the past life. So I want to tell you about a couple of cases like that. Uh, one is a little boy named Sam Taylor. Uh, he, was die, uh, he was born a year and a half after his paternal grandfather died. And then one day his dad was changing his diaper and Sam looked up at him and said, 
when I was your age, I used to change your diapers. And his parents thought that was really odd. They, they had never given reincarnation any thought. In fact, his mother was the daughter of a Southern Baptist missionary. Uh, but he kept making statements like this. He kept saying, I used to be grandpa and I used to be big. So his mother in particular became intrigued by this. So she would ask him questions. And she asked him about any siblings that he had. And he said how he had had a sister who had been murdered, and then she was turned into a fish. Well, it turned out the grandfather had had a sister who had been murdered some 60 years before, and then her body had been dumped in the bay. And uh, Sam's parents felt certain that he had never heard about her. Um, then when uh, the other thing, he talked about how near the end of his life, his wife would make milkshakes for him every day. And not just that she made milkshakes, but that she used the food processor to make them rather than the blender. And that, in fact, was true for his grandparents. So then when he was four and a half, his grandmother died. And his father went out to take care of her belongings. And he came back with some family photos, which they had not had before. So Sam's mom had them spread out on the coffee table, looking at them one day. When Sam walked over, and he saw pictures like this of his grandfather and started saying, that's me, that's me. Um, so to test him, his mother showed him this class photo and said, OK, show us which one you were. And he ran his finger along the different faces and then uh, stopped at the one of his grandfather and, and said, that's me. Now, the other case like this that I want to tell you about is, uh, involves a past life uh, in the Vietnam War. Um, it's a little boy named Stephen. He uh, was five years old when I met him, and he had asked his parents if they remembered when he was in the war. And he said that he was in the Army, and he described uh, the jungle and, and beaches. And he said it was 1969. So his parents asked him if he was talking about Vietnam, and he said yes. He gave various details, talking about his gun, talking about trenches and so forth. Said that he died in an explosion when he was 21. He also gave his last name. And his parents asked him what state he was from, and he named the state. So his mom then went to the Vietnam Memorial website and was shocked to find that there was a man from that state with that name who had been killed in Vietnam when he was 21. So she then wrote to me. She said she didn't do any more researching, but she wrote to me. And <clears throat> I did do some more searching. I joined an uh, online newspaper archive site and by doing that, I was able to access the, man, uh, the man's obituary. Uh, so I got various information about him. So then when I went to visit Stephen and his family, what I decided to do was take along some pictures to test him. So by using the obituary and following the various leads, um, I was able to get some pictures from uh, the past, li the life of this man with that name uh, who died in the Vietnam War. One thing was this guy had gone to a central high school. And of course, there are a lot of central high schools around. Uh, so with these pictures, what I did, I showed him things in pairs. One was a picture from the man's life. And the other was a control picture that was not from his life. So I wanted to see if Stephen would remember either one, and, and specifically remember the one that actually was from the guy's life. Um, so I showed him pictures of two central high schools, and he correctly pointed to the second one and said that he had been to that one. Um, I also showed him a picture of the house that the previous man had lived in when he was in high school uh, with a control picture, and Stephen didn't make a choice on that couple. And I don't know how the house may have changed in 50 years, but anyway, he said he didn't remember either one. Uh, but then I showed him pictures where one of them was from the house across the street from where the man had lived, as the one on the left, uh, which Stephen uh, correctly uh, said he remembered. 
Um, after I visited the family, I came back and I continued to do online sleuthing. And it's unbelievable sometimes what you can find online. So eventually, by being a member of classmates.com, I was able to access the high school yearbook of this fellow who had died, the yearbook of the year that he graduated from high school in 1968. Um, so then what I did was I, I got pictures from another yearbook from a different high school from 1968. So again, I, this time by email, I sent the mom pairs of pictures, one from the guy's life and one, one from the guy's school and one not. Now the good thing about this testing was the mom didn't know which was the correct picture either. So when she was showing him these pictures, there was no chance that he was picking up on cues from anyone about which was the correct picture. So I sent her uh, pages that show the, uh, the principal, and they don't really um, show up very well, but the principal and the administration, uh, pages of students, and then pages of teachers, and Stephen was right on all of those. And when I told the mom that, uh, she emailed back and said, oh, wow, that is crazy. He was so casual about it. Um, so then I wrote to the previous man's sister, and uh, her daughter wrote back and sent some family photos. Now, unfortunately, with the photos that she had, um, um, there wasn't a great picture of the man's mother. I, I showed him, Stephen, a, or sent a picture uh, of the mother with the control, and, and Stephen said he, he wasn't sure about either one. Uh, but I also sent him pictures where one of them was the father, and he correctly pointed to the one on, on the right, which uh, was the, the previous man's father, and then said he was tired of looking at pictures. Um, but for the Pairs of pictures that he made a choice on. He made a choice on six of them, and he was six out of six. So that would be like flipping a coin six times and having it come up heads every time. The odds of that occurring by chance are one out of 64. Um, so there's only a one and a half percent chance that, he, uh, that Stephen got all those just by luck. Now, in medical studies, we consider anything uh, with um, any study that has a greater than 95% chance uh, of, of occurring um, to be statistically significant. In this case, it was over 98% uh, based on these testing. Uh, so that was statistically significant, and, and the tests provide evidence that Stephen uh, does in fact have a connection with this young man who lost his life uh, during the Vietnam War. Now, along with the statements that the children make, a lot of them show behaviors that seem connected to the past life. So I've mentioned that many of them show emotions, and, and they will show emotions that are appropriate for the relationship that the previous person had with individual family members. So for instance, a little girl may be very deferential toward the previous um, husband or previous parents, but very bossy toward the younger siblings, even though those younger siblings are much older than the child is. Uh, these emotions will usually fade as the statements do, but not always. And there's at least one case where the little boy eventually grew up and married the widow of the previous person. Uh, now, obviously, she was quite a bit older than he was, but, but they did end up getting married. Uh, phobias. In the unnatural death cases, over 35% of the children will show an intense fear toward the mode of death that the previous person suffered. So for instance, there was a little girl in Thailand where from the time she was born, she hated being in water. So even as an infant, it would take three adults to hold her down to give her a bath. And then when she got old enough to talk, uh, describe the life of a girl in another village who had drowned in an accident. Um, likes and dislikes. <clears throat> this picture, if you can see, is a young child smoking a cigarette. And 
this is not a picture of one of our cases, but it could be because unfortunately, it seems that addictive substances can sometimes continue their allure even across lifetimes. So if the previous person was a heavy smoker or heavy drinker, then these young kids will often try to sneak cigarettes or even sneak alcohol. Uh, there's one case where a neighbor was letting the little boy have alcohol and, until his family found out about it and, and put a stop to it. Uh, and then food likes and dislikes, the, the most obvious examples are Ian found uh, 24 cases of children in Burma who said that they had been Japanese soldiers who were killed in Burma during World War II. And the kids would often complain about the spicy Burmese food and, and ask to eat raw fish and, and that sort of thing instead. And then themes in play, uh, a lot of these kids will play for hours on end with themes that seem connected to the past life, most often the occupation of the previous person. So there's one little boy where the, the previous man had been a biscuit shopkeeper and this kid would play compulsively at, at being a biscuit shopkeeper and refuse to do anything else, including refuse to do schoolwork. And he, he fell behind in, in school, and his mom felt like he was really never able to catch up. Um, and then gender nonconformity. So <clears throat> in the general population, most young children will show gender typical behavior. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons we can discuss of why that is, but most kids will show gender typical behavior. So for instance, little girls will be more likely to play with dolls, little boys more likely to play with cars and trucks. Um, but about 3% of boys and 5% of girls will show gender nonconformity, where they don't show the behaviors that are typical of, for their natal sex. When well, our cases where the child remembers a past life as a member of the opposite sex, 80% of them will show gender nonconformity. Um, and sometimes that will persist all the way into adulthood, and then other times it will fade away as the kids age. Um, and I should add that 90% of our cases, the child does talk about a memory as a life, uh, a life as a member of the same sex. It's only 10% where they report an opposite sex life, and, and again, many of them will show gender nonconformity. Uh, so for all of these um, behavioral kinds of things, uh, they show that it's not just memories that seem able to survive and carry on to another life, that it looks like feelings and emotions can also continue on and then show up and in the next life. Um, so I want to finish up by uh, telling you about a case with some pretty prominent behaviors. And it's a, uh, a little boy named James Leininger. And uh, this case got a fair amount of press when he was younger. Um, it was on TV some. His parents eventually wrote a book about their experiences. Uh, but he was a boy who talked about being a pilot who was killed during World War II. And it's now believed that that pilot has been identified. So his parents are this Christian couple in Louisiana. And his father in particular was completely opposed to the idea of reincarnation. Um, even after James started talking about a past life, and it took some time before his father was ultimately convinced that he had, in fact, remembered a past life. Uh, so the story began when James was 22 months old, and he and his dad went to a flight museum. Well, James was fascinated by the World War II exhibit. Uh, kept insisting on going back to it to the point that he and his dad spent three hours at the museum, which, for those of you who are parents, try taking a toddler to a museum for three hours and, and see how that goes. Um, and then a couple months later, around the time of James's second birthday, he started having horrible nightmares multiple times a week in which he would kick his legs up in the air and scream, airplane crash on fire, little man can't get out. After I spent a weekend going over all the material with, with James and his parents, I also talked with his aunt. 
And she said, you couldn't believe how disturbing these things were to witness, that they really looked like somebody fighting for his life. And then during the day, James would take his little toy airplanes and he would say, airplane crash on fire, and bam, he would slam them nose first into the coffee table. And James's parents are apparently very tolerant people uh, because their coffee table, if you can see, had dozens of scratches and dents from airplane crash on fire, bam. That sort of play is what we in, in children's mental health refer to as post-traumatic play. And when you combine that with the nightmares that James was having, he really looked like a traumatized child. Uh, but he hadn't been traumatized, at, at least in this life. And then his parents were able to have several conversations with him about this material um, uh, while he was awake, um, soon after his second birthday. So he said how his plane had crashed on fire, how it had been, how it had been shot down by the Japanese, and he said that he flew a Corsair. Now, I'd never heard of a Corsair, but it was a special plane that was developed during World War II. Um, after this case got some publicity, critics said, well, he just saw a Corsair at the Flight Museum and the name stuck with him. And in fact, if you go to the Flight Museum's website, as some skeptics did, uh, you see that they have a, a Corsair there. James's dad said it was not there when he and James visited, so I looked into it and found that, in fact, his dad was right. The museum had had a Corsair, but it had crashed at a public air show the year before, and then they didn't get a replacement until three years later. Uh, so that is not where James learned about Corsairs. Um, he also said that he flew off of a boat, and his parents asked him the name of the boat, and he said, Natoma. Now, I think if most of us were going to try to guess the name of a U.S. aircraft carrier, it would be a long time before we said Natoma. And in fact, when he said that, James's dad said to him, well, that sounds Japanese to me, son. And James said, uh, no, it was American. Um, so after that conversation, James's dad went and did an online search and eventually found this information on the USS Natoma Bay. And he printed out the information, which you probably can't see unless you have really good eyes. But the footer at the bottom shows the date when he printed it out, 8-27-2000. James was born in April of 98. So this documents that by the time he was 28 months old, that Natoma was part of the story. And it turned out that this USS Natoma Bay was an escort carrier that was stationed in the Pacific during World War II. Now, his parents also asked James what his name was then. And he always just said me or James, which they didn't make anything of at the time. And they asked him one time who else was there. And he said, Jack, Jack Larson. This was all uh, when he was two. Then when he was two and a half, his father uh, bought this book on Iwo Jima to give to his father, to give to James's grandfather. And he was looking through it one day when James came and got in his lap. And they got to this page with a picture of Iwo Jima. And James pointed at it and said, that's where my plane was shot down. And his dad said, what? And he said, my airplane got shot down there, Daddy. And that just floored his father that his two-and-a-half-year-old was talking that way. And then he learned that the Natoma Bay did, in fact, take part in the Iwo Jima operation. Then when James got old enough to draw, he drew dozens of pictures of planes and battle scenes, and he always signed them James III. Now, I thought that might be because he was three years old when he was drawing them, but his parents said, no, they asked him about it, and he said, I'm the third James. I'm James III. And in fact, he continued to sign them that way even after he got older. So with all this going on, his parents did begin to wonder if he was 
recall in a past life. So eventually, when he was four and a half, his uh, father attended the Natoma Bay reunion. And he learned that, in fact, there was a Jack Larson who had been on the ship. Uh, James's dad had been looking for Jack Larson among the war dead, but this Jack Larson had survived the war and was even still alive. So James's dad went and met with him, learned that he was on the ship during the Iwo Jima operation. He also learned that there was one and only one pilot from the ship who was killed during the Iwo Jima operation. Uh, this was a young man from Pennsylvania named James Houston. So this means that if James Leininger was remembering a past life, it had to be Houston's life because he was the only pilot from the ship who was killed there. Um, so we can compare to see how well they match. Now, James's parents say that he also talked about family life before the war. But we don't have documentation of those statements that was made before Houston was identified. But what we can do, I've listed all the items where we have definite documentation that was made before anyone knew anything about James Houston. So James signed his drawings James III. Houston was James Jr., which would make James Leininger the third James. James said that he flew off the Natoma. Houston was a pilot on the USS Natoma Bay. James said that he flew a Corsair. Houston had flown a Corsair. He was actually flying a different plane when he was killed, but he was part of the squadron that had tested the Corsair for the Navy. James said that he was shot down by the Japanese. Houston was shot down by the Japanese. James said he died at Iwo Jima. Houston was the one and only Natoma Bay pilot killed during the Iwo Jima operation. James said one time, quote, my airplane got shot in the engine and crashed in the water and that's how I died. Eyewitnesses reported that Houston's plane was, quote, hit head on right on the middle of the engine. James had nightmares of <clears throat> his plane crashing and sinking in the water. Houston's plane crashed in the water and quickly sank. And James said that Jack Larson was there and Jack Larson was the pilot of the plane next to Houston's on the day that he was killed. With that, I will stop and I will be happy to take questions.